Each year, over 1,200 tornadoes touch down across the United States. The majority of these tornadoes are weak, causing minimal damage over a span of only a few miles. But 100 years ago, in March of 1925, a tornado of epic proportions would tear a path through three states in the Midwest. Its name lives in infamy as the worst event of its kind in American history, the Tri-State Tornado. Although extensive discussion has focused on the historical accounts of this monumental storm, less attention has been given to the specific meteorological characteristics which led to its formation. So in this video, we're going to dive into the factors supporting this catastrophic event and answer the question, what caused the Tri-State Tornado? In the early 20th century, weather observations weren't as frequent nor as detailed as they are today. The United States Weather Bureau, now known as the National Weather Service, was initially founded in 1870 before becoming part of the Department of Agriculture in 1891. In this role, the organization mainly supported agricultural operations and climatological studies. Primary Weather Bureau offices recorded detailed surface analyses only twice per day and the organization was taking limited upper-level observations through kite and pilot balloon flights. The first paper regarding the Tri-State Tornado in scientific literature was published by Alfred J. Henry, a principal meteorologist at Weather Bureau headquarters. In 1925, Henry was an editor for the Monthly Weather Review, a peer-reviewed scientific journal which covers meteorological research and observations. In the April 1925 edition of this publication, Henry presented a surface chart for around midday on March 18th, but there was a significant discrepancy between where he stated the synoptic cyclone was located and where surface isobars depicted it. In 1966, researchers Stanley Shagnon and Richard Simonin redid this surface analysis and the Weather Bureau's synoptic chart, adding fronts without considering wind and temperature and showing a strong low pressure bias for the cyclone. Both the 1925 and 1966 publications suggested that the supercell and tornado formed behind the cold front, a concept which our modern understanding of severe weather deems very unlikely, as most tornadic supercells develop either along boundaries or in the open warm sector of an extratropical cyclone. Over the years, the event received little attention in the scientific literature. But finally, in March of 2013, a paper titled Meteorological Analyses of the Tri-State Tornado Event of March 1925 was published in the Electronic Journal of Severe Storms Meteorology. This paper was authored by Robert Maddox, Matthew Gilmore, Robert Johns, Charlie Crisp, Donald Burgess, John Hart, Stephen Pilts, and the late Charles Doswell III, who tragically passed away in January this year. The paper contains a synthesis of ideas derived from modern research utilizing as much data from the time frame as could be obtained. This paper, hereafter Maddox et al. 2013, is likely the single greatest modern analysis of the Tri-State Tornado, and is the source of most information presented in this video. For even more detailed information, I urge you to read the paper for yourself, as linked in the description. When we talk about the synoptic scale in meteorology, we're referring to the large-scale features associated with weather systems, the jet stream, large-scale low-pressure systems, and frontal boundaries at the interface of different air masses. Cyclone tracks from March's monthly weather review, as noted in Maddox et al. 2013, seem to point toward a persistent ridge of high pressure on the west coast, with a broad trough downstream over the central United States. The authors note that a mid to upper level shortwave trough likely traversed this jet stream configuration before ejecting into the plains, helping to lower pressure within a lead trough over Colorado. Strengthening upper level winds associated with jet stream disturbances often promote low surface pressure east of the Rocky Mountains. This set the stage for the synoptic cyclone which would eventually produce the Tri-State Tornado. The reanalyzed 500 millibar chart for noon on March 18th shows the progression of the low in tandem with the short wave. The chart may also hint at a negative tilt developing in the trough, that is, a northwest to southeast orientation of the trough axis, which often leads to better dynamics and a more favorable environment for severe weather downstream. At the same time, multiple synoptic scale boundaries were developing around the low. A warm front, initially along the Gulf Coast, was lifting northward to meet the low, and a cold front was sweeping in from the west, as depicted by these reanalyzed Weather Bureau maps. Maddox et al. 2013 also found the presence of a dry line connected to the low. 
As Abilene, Texas reported a temperature of 81 degrees and a dew point of 6 degrees the day before the storm. The authors note that it had been unusually warm and dry over the central U.S. in the months preceding the storm, which would seem to make conditions more favorable for strong dry line development. Interestingly, the synoptic low wasn't particularly intense. The authors estimated its central pressure around 998 millibars during the tri-state tornado. For comparison, the surface low which produced the March 31, 2023 tornado outbreak was around 989 millibars and the low associated with the 1974 super outbreak was about 983 millibars. Although the central pressure wasn't extremely low, what really mattered was the pressure gradient. The pressure gradient force is what sets the wind in motion and depends on how pressure changes over a given distance. Even if the cyclone in question isn't very deep, if the radial pressure change around it is strong, then winds will be enhanced. Strong wind gusts were indicated at various stations on the afternoon of March 18th, even outside of thunderstorms, indicating that the pressure gradients near the center of the low were also strong. These winds would help to strengthen wind shear and increase advection, both of which likely had a role in generating and maintaining the supercell. One important factor for the Tri-State Tornado appears to have been the position of the warm front or, more specifically, its parent storm's position relative to the front. Even as early as Alfred Henry's 1925 analysis of the event, researchers depicted the supercell as being in close proximity to the synoptic low. And indeed, we can find evidence of the cell's adjacency to the cool sector through eyewitness reports. In the book, The Great Tri-State Tornado, author Justin Harder compiles historical accounts of the event, providing important context from the people who experienced it. In it, he writes, the rain began falling more steadily through the morning, and later on, ahead of the tornado's path in Gorham, Illinois, the rain had started an hour or two earlier. Everyone glanced outside at the occasional person ambling down the street, soaked but unbothered. These reports of rain and cool temperatures leading up to the tornado point to the storm's close proximity to the warm front. Furthermore, reports of rising temperatures and gusty winds immediately before the tornado revealed that the supercell was likely moving along or near the boundary, with its inflow drawing on the warm, moist maritime tropical air to the south. The newly analyzed surface maps in Maddox et al. 2013 align with this idea, indicating that the Tri-State Tornado's supercell remained along this baroclinic zone during the tornado's life cycle. A baroclinic zone is a region in which the temperature gradient exists on a constant pressure surface. And since these corridors are often marked by enhanced wind shear, supercell interaction with warm fronts can result in significant tornadoes. Such was the case on April 9, 2015, when a supercell along a warm front in northern Illinois produced the violent Rochelle de Fairdale EF4 tornado. This positioning dispels early theories about the supercell interacting with the cold sector or being co-located with the synoptic low, although it was very close to the latter. The persistent rain north of the warm front helped to sharpen the boundary during the day, enhancing its density gradient and providing stronger wind shear near the low. The sharp warm frontal gradient can easily be seen in the maximum temperature map from March 18th. The consistent position of the parent supercell near the triple point, where the warm front and dry line met with the synoptic low, seems to have been the distinguishing factor in the Tri-State Tornado event. This was seen during the 1974 super outbreak as well, when the longest track tornado of the event developed near the synoptic scale triple point. Exact calculations of instability are difficult to determine from 1925. CAPE, one of the most widely recognized measures of atmospheric instability, is calculated vertically in the atmosphere through a region called the free convective layer. The sparse nature of upper-level data during the time period renders accurate CAPE calculations very unlikely, if not impossible. However, we can infer that at least moderate buoyancy was present in the air mass feeding the Tri-State Tornado supercell. As mentioned earlier, the warm front ushered in a moist low-level air mass over the Ohio Valley, with dew points at or above 60 degrees along and south of the boundary. This can be verified through 7 a.m. observations from Little Rock, Arkansas, which showed a dew point of 62 degrees. The dew point dropped by 20 degrees by noon, and relative humidity fell by 56% after the passage of the dry line noted in Maddox et al. 2013. Because water vapor molecules are lighter than molecular oxygen and nitrogen, the two most abundant elements in the atmosphere, more moisture means lower density per unit mass. Air also tends to become less dense as it warms and expands. Thus, this combination of warmer temperatures and greater moisture in the low levels, surmounted by higher density air aloft, created low-level atmospheric instability in the warm sector. However, 
When the mid-levels of the atmosphere are warmer and drier than low levels, atmospheric stability is created. This elevated warm layer is called a capping inversion. Because it is an inversion of the normal trend of cooling with height, and acts as a cap to prevent upward motion. Maddox et al. 2013 noted that dry lines are most common in the central plains, and the fact that the boundary had progressed to the Mississippi River by 2 p.m. implies that the dry air and capping aloft made it unusually far east during the tri-state tornado. When a cap is present, thunderstorms can usually only form if surface heating is strong enough to erode it, or if lifting is great enough to overcome it. It seems likely that strong lifting near the frontal triple point was able to overcome the cap and allow the tri-state supercell to develop, and the inversion suppressed additional storms until mid-afternoon. This kept the supercell isolated from interference produced by any surrounding storms, which made it more likely to produce significant tornadoes and to maintain a steady structure. Additionally, the dry air aloft may have also been a sign of steeper lapse rates, the rate at which temperature changes with height. This may have been enhanced by cold air aloft advancing with the trough's negative tilt, as simple personal calculations estimate that the temperature 6 kilometers above ground may have been as low as negative 10 to negative 15 degrees Celsius. These steeper lapse rates would further enhance instability. The low-level moisture didn't just help to increase instability. When air near the surface is forcefully lifted, it can reach a height at which it condenses into a cloud. This is called the lifted condensation level, or LCL height. Because the LCL height is related to both temperature and dew point, higher relative humidity will produce lower LCLs. Given the persistent rainfall early in the day of March 18th, surface relative humidity was probably even higher near the warm front and tornado track than the 85% measurement in Little Rock. Eyewitness reports would corroborate this situation, as gloomy conditions consistent with low clouds were commonly observed. Low LCL heights can make successful tornado genesis more likely, especially once they get below 500 meters. LCL heights near the tri-state tornado were likely only a few hundred meters above ground. This can allow tornadoes to more easily develop because the rotating cloud base is already close to the ground, and less evaporation in the rear flank downdraft can make it more buoyant. Interestingly, this might also help to explain the tornado's reportedly unusual visual presentation. Justin Harder writes, They sensed a storm was coming but could not see a tornado. Most thought the wind had picked up enough of the iron-rich soil to appear more like a dust storm. And later, as the tornado came into DeSoto, Illinois, a brow of fog hung over the horizon, spilling rain and debris. Almost no one saw it coming. Many people in the storm's path didn't recognize the tornado because it didn't present a clear condensation funnel. Because of very low cloud bases and high relative humidity, the tornado was able to grow into an unrecognizably large mass, a chaotic swirl of clouds and rain up to a mile and a half wide. Remnant mist and supercell rain wrapping may have also played a role in limiting visibility, making the tornado look like a rolling fog instead of a tall, slender funnel. Undoubtedly, Vertical wind shear played a pivotal role in the storm's development. Wind shear, which develops when wind changes speed and or direction with height, is the fundamental source of thunderstorm updraft rotation. There are many ways in which it can be measured. Bulk wind difference, or bulk shear, measures the vector difference between two points on the vertical wind profile. One common form of this used in severe weather forecasting is the 0 to 6 km bulk shear, which is the shear vector from the surface to 6 km above ground. We can infer from the supercell's close proximity to the deepening surface low that it was likely within or near a strong wind speed maximum aloft. Surface lows often develop in the exit region of such strong jets, and the closer you get to the low, the stronger the flow aloft and the stronger the deep layer wind shear. Traditionally, values of 0 to 6 km bulk shear above 25 to 40 knots have been considered favorable for supercells, but according to estimates from approximated photographs shown in Maddox et al. 2013, the 0 to 6 km bulk shear may have been as high as 80 to 100 knots. This was likely achieved by the very strong winds aloft near the low. Additionally, the orientation of the 0 to 6 km shear vector may have been nearly perpendicular to the initiating boundary, the dry line, which would minimize interference from any anvil clouds or precipitation from storms to the south. These wind shear factors are more than supportive of well-organized, long-lived, and fast-moving supercells. Another way to assess wind shear is by measuring the area of the hodograph relative to the storm motion vector. This is how we calculate storm relative velocity, or SRH. SRH is the product of both the streamwise part of vorticity and the storm relative wind, vertically integrated over some depths of the atmosphere. 
Essentially, it is an estimate intended to evaluate the propensity for cyclonic updraft rotation in right-moving supercells. Although there's more complexity to it, the idea is that the higher the SRH, the more likely discrete storms are to rotate in low levels. One form of this parameter which has been used extensively is the 0-3 km SRH. Traditionally, the values of 0-3 km SRH above 200 to 250 meters square per second squared have been associated with an increased likelihood of tornadoes in supercells. In Maddox et al. 2013, Hodograph B shows the estimated vertical wind profile in the vicinity of the warm front and gives 0-3 km SRH of 340 meters square per second squared. The authors note that this suggests the influence of a strong low-level jet, a lower tropospheric wind maximum often found ahead of synoptic cyclones, which tends to increase low-level wind shear. Although deep layer shear is more important for supercell formation and longevity, the large values of SRH further point to an environment favorable for intense tornadoes. Lastly, the storm relative wind component to the wind profile is also interesting. It is feasible that the 0 to 1 km storm relative wind, which approximates the inflow for right moving supercells, was in excess of 45 knots for the tri state tornado. Storm relative inflow of this magnitude could have favored the development of a particularly large mesocyclone, as supported by research presented by Cameron Nixon. The large mesocyclone could have been more resilient to adverse changes in its environment, aiding in its longevity. The significant influx of moisture this would have produced also could have reduced visibility of the actual tornado. The closest modern analog we have to the Tri-State Tornado occurred only four years ago. On the night of December 10th, 2021, a prolific supercell would track hundreds of miles over the Mid-South. The most infamous tornado spawned by this storm tore a path of destruction nearly 167 miles long in western Kentucky, the longest officially surveyed tornado track in history. There are many environmental differences between the two events. Although the 2021 tornado had larger SRH, deep layer wind shear, which is shown to be more important for long-lived supercells, was likely stronger during the Tri-State Tornado. The Tri-State Tornado also likely benefited from its close proximity to the synoptic low and movement near the triple point, while the 2021 tornado did not. Debate continues as to whether or not the Tri-State Tornado was on the ground for a whole 219 miles. But given the aforementioned factors, it is clear that environmental conditions were supportive of long-track tornadoes. The Tri-State Tornado has etched an indelible mark in American history. Town after town across three states was left in ruins. And as the fire slowly died down, amid the cold wind which whistled through a ravaged landscape, 695 people were dead. It caused $2.9 billion in damage in 2024 dollars, making it the third costliest tornado in U.S. history. Given its significance in tornado history, it's important for us to understand the circumstances of its development as well as possible. The authors of the 2013 paper of this event concluded that there was no particular factor in this event which would explain the Tri-State Tornado's historic track. However, several aspects of the setup appear conducive to long-track tornadoes. Amid a destabilizing air mass, the supercell developed in unusually close proximity to the synoptic low, likely near the intersection of the warm front and an unusually far east dry line. The tornadic cell remained in the vicinity of the warm front for much of its life, the boundary being enhanced by a sharp temperature gradient. The cell was also supported by extremely strong deep layer wind shear, and low level shear was enhanced near the low. With very low cloud bases, the relatively warm RFD may have also had difficulty wrapping around the fast-moving storm, limiting the occurrence of mesocyclone occlusions. We can't be certain exactly what made the Tri-State Tornado stand out from other storms, except for this. To this day, it still stands as the deadliest tornado in American history.